So we get into the end of the semester. Yay, right? Uh, so um, we're gonna, as we move into the last few weeks of the class, we're going to talk about wrapping up the audit. Not that information technology is wrapping up the audit, but just to introduce you to some of the uh, issues or concerns or factors that auditors consider when they are auditing in an environment with a, um, information technology. So you, some, I'm not sure if some of you have done internships before, so you might be aware of this, but firms use the client's information, accounting information systems, uh, to gather evidence about the different assertions that management makes. So depending on how complex the client's accounting information system are will determine whether or not the auditors need to have information technology auditors on the engagement because they're going to have to look at controls um, that are embedded in the accounting information system. And we'll talk, that's what we'll talk about today. I'm also going to make sure we have time to talk a little bit about audit analytics, which is not necessarily covered in the textbook, but I think it's an important area. And just as a segue, because we're going to have someone come in on Tuesday um, to talk, uh, to do a demonstration of, of audit analytics and how audit analytics can be used to gather audit evidence and how auditors use audit analytics and uh, things such as analytical review procedures or risk assessment. So, uh, so when we have time today, I'll just do a segue into audit analytics. So, um, you know we're living in an information environment. We hear about all of the threats, um, cybersecurity threats, people hacking in to um, you know, companies' databases and getting access to customer information such as credit cards. Um, at least twice a company that I have done business with or a bank, um, I'm trying to think of a department store, uh, and even a company that I work for, their systems were hacked. Or, you know, certain information was stolen, so my information was at risk. One, what the company that I work for, my employment information, so things like my social security number, personal information, and so uh, companies try to avoid that to the extent possible. So they're always looking to improve their security. So cybersecurity is a big air area um, because as fast as companies can come up with solutions to try to address. Uh, security vulnerabilities, hackers, like, you know, are way ahead of them. We saw what happened in the recent elections, and, you know, with the DNC and emails being hacked. So uh, it is an ever growing problem. So companies are vulnerable. We're vulnerable, companies are vulnerable. Um, and so, you know, they have, from an audit perspective, if someone, uh, if a company doesn't have appropriate security around their accounting information system, then if they're hacked or if information can be processed incorrectly or just if employees, not even from external threats, but internal threats, so if employees have access to information that they shouldn't have. So if you, you know, when employees are terminated, they're terminated, right? They're walked out of the building, they can't get access, all of their access to, um, you know, systems are taken away or shut down, so they cannot have access anymore. Um, because companies are concerned about, as they should be, uh, someone, if someone, uh, you know, getting into the system and making changes that are unauthorized. So it is a, a huge threat to accounting information systems, and you're going to, you know, auditors look for the security around the systems, and that's really where uh, IT auditors are more knowledgeable because it's what they do. So some of the things that, uh, issues that arise in the accounting information uh, in IT environment are things like input errors. So human error, right, where they're inputting information into the system. Are they inputting that information correctly? What are the checks and balances to ensure that the information is input correctly? So for example, um, management makes an assertion uh, about occurrence with respect to revenue. And so the occurrence assertion says that all um, sales that are reported, all revenue that's reported in the financial statements, have a, has occurred, right? The, the, um, the transaction occurred and it's made to a non-fictitious customer. 
So for audit, so auditors are going to not only look for evidence that it occurred, right? So they're going to look at to see if there's a corresponding shipping document, but they also want to know did it was the transaction uh, made with a, a a verified customer, an approved customer. So you would want to see input controls around uh, recording sales. So you want to see that when a sale is initiated or processed, when that customer order is processed, is processed for an approved customer, a customer who resides in the customer master file. So uh, when the, a salesperson or customer service agent inputs that customer number, it should match with the customer master file. And if there's no customer there, that transaction, I'm sorry, that order should be processed until there's an approval. So the first step in that input is to ensure that uh, the sale or the uh, transaction is uh, initiated uh, for a, a customer that's been authorized that resides in the customer master file. Um, other things would be uh, that you're also concerned about a systematic versus random errors. So random errors are errors that occur once, you know, there's, it's, it's not linked to any uh, particular uh, system, whereas a systematic uh, error is one that occurs and has an impact. So there's a problem with the processing, right? Or there's a problem with how that transaction is being processed through the system. So that error is spread throughout the entire system. So that's more pervasive. Systematic errors are more pervasive. Um, lack of an audit trail. Uh, if you have everything, so, so companies have very sophisticated uh, accounting information systems, ERP system. So if uh, the controls are built in to the accounting information system, how does the auditor check those controls? Like there's no paper. Trail. So they would audit the system. They would audit that the processing of the, that transaction and the appropriate controls within the system. Um, so, for example, if the auditor is looking at controls over cash disbursements, and the controls over cash disbursement says that before a disbursement is made, you have to have a three-way match. It has to be an approved purchase order, a receiving report indicating that the goods were received, and an invoice from the vendor indicating that we've been billed, the client has been billed for the goods, right? And then based on those three items, uh, a disbursement can be made for, for that vendor. Um, so if this, all, this can all occur in the system. The system can check to ensure that those three items are present before processing of cash disbursement. What the audit, auditor would have to do is audit through the system. They'd have to, so one of the things, and we'll talk about this in a moment, but one of the things they can do is uh, enter data, right? Enter uh, data to see all of the checkpoints, uh, a simulated data to see all of the checkpoints are operating, that if they um, enter a simulated cash disbursement, that there's a, uh, the system won't process it because there is, if it's simulated, that means there's no receiving report, there's no purchase order, there's no vendor invoice. So they would look to see that the system would kick that disbursement out. So that's one way to check because of lack of an audit trail. So they would audit through the computer. You also have to be concerned with inappropriate access to computer files and programs. And this becomes even more important in a IT environment where, multiple, where controls are built into the system um, and you want to make sure that people can't up, have unauthorized access to update or change how things are programmed. So you want to make sure that someone can't go in and override the, let's say, for example, the credit authorization process, or override the um, customer approval process. So, and if there are changes, you want to know, you want to see evidence, and that the company has controls in place to ensure that that uh, a file or an edit report is generated 
to, to someone with authority to ensure that those types of changes have been approved and reviewed and approved. And then, obviously, if you're using um, a more integrated uh, accounting information system, then you have less human involvement. So there's some pros and cons to that, right? Because reduced human involvement means how do you use errors? Because transactions are going to happen the same way all the time, and they're going to be processed the same way all the time by the system. And so you reduce errors. But the other end of that is you take away judgment, right? um, or that set of eyes, that you know, or that intuition, or things like that. So there's a cost benefit <coughs> to uh, having an audit. Clearly, an accounting information system increases efficiency and, and, probably, and, and effectiveness as well, because you know the transactions are going to be processed the same way all the time, right? Um, so when we think through controls, because the controls in the uh, accounting information system, the approach doesn't change. We're still talking about controls. It's just in this case we're talking about controls related to the accounting information system, general controls and application controls. But we still need to gather an understanding of those controls. What kind of what types of controls do they have in place? Do they have uh, controls that are consistent with uh, the control framework? So we do need to understand and document. Um, controls related to automated processing of those transactions. Right, are there proper safeguards? Uh, uh, is there a proper segregation? For example. And based on how, how the understanding we gather, we have to assess control risks. Right? No different than we did in financial control. We have to consider um, what the risk is. Can we, and we're doing that because we want to know whether or not we can rely on the controls. And this is important, obviously, because we're talking about the processing of transactions. And so we can rely on the accounting information system in terms of processing the transaction that increases the risk that the transactions are being processed inappropriately or incorrectly. And then depending on our assessment, we decide on the amount of testing that we're going to do to evaluate the compliance with those controls. Uh, so it's the same approach, gain an understanding, assess the risk, given your risk assessment, determine what your testing approach will be. So there are two types of two general types of computer controls. One is ge um, general controls, and that's at this high level over the entire system. So those are more pervasive. If those controls are absent, it, 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 it creates systematic processing uh, errors. Right? It's pervasive throughout the system. Automated application controls deals with the application, such as the sales and collection cycle, or the acquisition and expenditure cycle, the, the inventory cycle. Right? So those are the applications. The applications are the business processes. So the, the controls around that. So they relate to business activity and they are directly related to uh, management assertions, right? Because management's making assertions about transactions and the application controls are around. The application captures the uh, the transactions, right? They're the, the, so we're going to be concerned about controls around those transactions. So for example, the three-way match if that control is going to be built into the application, into the expenditure and acquisition cycle, the application, the pur or uh, purchase to pay. That's where the three-way match was. The matching of the shipping document uh, to ensure that uh, a sale is only recorded when there is a, uh, a corresponding shipping document, that control is going to be housed in the application of sales, order to cash, the sales, uh, sales and collection cycle. So there are several categories of general controls. And as I said before, these controls are at the very high level, the general controls. So they're going to deal with programming, 
program development, program change controls, those things. So program development controls deals with the acquisition and development of new programs. And so you can imagine why it's important to have controls around that. So if you want to make sure, so the auditor is going to look for uh, proper authorization, um, and that is conducted with organization policy. Um, appropriate users participate in the process. Because you're talking about um, developing your programs, the people who are involved in the process that those programs are being developed for should be a, a part of the, the, the design and development of that um, program. Right, so if you think about, if you're developing an application program for sales uh, and collection, you want to make sure that accounting is involved in that because they have to consider what controls should be built into the system. So the financial people, the accounting people, are going to be more knowledgeable about the application controls that should be embedded. Remember, those application controls are tied to the assertions, right? They're tied to um, the business activities. So you want to make sure that the appropriate of people are involved. Um, also important is that no program should go live without being tested and validated. <coughs> so you don't want to shut off, you switch, you know, shut off the lights on one program and start another program without it being tested and validated to make sure that it's working. Because once that program goes live, it's now capturing all your transactions. Right? It's now processing all your transactions and you want to make sure that it's being processed appropriately. And of course, it's always you want to ensure that there's proper uh, documentation. So those are the types of things that the uh, auditors will look for in terms of controls around development. Similar for uh, program change controls. That it's properly authorized uh, in accordance with the company's policies. That the appropriate users are involved in the process. Um, that it's tested valid and validated prior to um, there's appropriate documentation. And use, uh, what can happen with changes is sometimes changes are a response to um, uh, perhaps a program not operating uh, as intended uh, or not meeting the needs of the users of that program. Um, so sometimes there might be a need to have an emergency change. So you can look for um, documentation and approval around that process. And everything should be an emergency. Because companies change or develop programs, it's a planned process. Right? It's not, you know, it's a well, it should be a well thought out process. So program development, program change controls, and then computer operations. So the people who are responsible for the operations uh, related to processing of transactions and backup of data and recovery of data. The operating of the, of, of the system IT environment. And so controls that you're looking for here, you're going to look for controls in the processing environment. And so you can have batch processing or real-time processing. And batch pro processing is that you capture the transactions that the process at some point in time. So maybe it's daily or nightly. Whereas real-time processing is your updating transactions are being processed in real time. You're updating as the transactions are being uh, processed without any delay. So those are the two types of processing environments. Um, and there's no you know, uh, rhyme or reason to either whatever company you want is you know, uh, not considered more or less of a control. Um, it's just that there should be, uh, if, if you're doing batch processing, maybe one of the things you're going to be more concerned with uh, as an auditor could be cut off, right? That they're, they're updating the uh, records on a timely basis. Right? But that's true, uh, which there's probably less of a concern when it's real time processing, right? There's probably less um, risk around cutoff. Some uh, types of controls, uh, we've seen this before. Separation of duties, no different. It's just the duties that are being separated. 
it's still the same idea of no one should have the ability to have access to data, change that data, and it not be caught. Right? That they could make an unauthorized change and it not be detected on a timely basis. Right? Or they could make it and cover it up. So in this case, because we're talking about an accounting information system, we're looking at uh, duties amongst assistance analysts, programmers, and computer operators. Those duties should be separate. Um, the other thing, you, another control you want to see is that data and data and files are appropriately labeled. Um, you want to also make sure that data and files are stored in a secure area. It's protected. You want to make sure that there's backup. There's a backup or disaster recovery plan um, that a company has in place. So, and this becomes really disaster recovery. And, and most companies you'll see that they will um, do, they will check the disaster recovery, they will run um, uh, simulations to ensure that the data is, is in, you know, that is being recovered in a timely basis. If, if it's offline, that they are able to go back and get back up and running uh, quickly. So this is something that companies do on a routine basis and making sure. So as from an audit perspective, we're going to be concerned with whether or not they have this plan in place, how often they test it, what kinds of, if there were any exceptions, how those exceptions were dealt with. So obviously, a, a, some of these more technical areas are going to be done by the IT auditors, right? um, to the extent that the, the auditing engagement has an IT auditor assigned to it. I would suggest that if it's a very complex accounting information environment or uh, IT environment, the likely, that it certainly if it's a very large client engagement, um, there's probably going to be IT auditors as, as a part of the audit engagement team. So it's a second knowledge check question. Personal lives, we use passwords. 
Um, so passwords, and some companies will require you to change passwords uh, every 90 days. It becomes annoying. Right? And, and if you're in a certain um, sector, such as the financial services sector or banking, there people have these, uh, these, these uh, I don't know what they call them, like you plug it into your computer, and it gives you a password. So your password is updated all the time. So in some number you or phrase you won't know. So it changes daily because they're trying to avoid people uh, using passwords that can be easily guessed. And we tend to use passwords that people can figure out. So how many of you uh, use a password that includes the birthday, um, some date of some relative or even yourself? <laughs> How many people use passwords um, that uh, it tells something about something unique to them? Right. So think about how many of you use social media? Oh, come on, everybody can use social media except me. Right. So, and you know when people join social media, how many of you have given a shout out on social media? Oh, it's my mom's birthday, or my sister's birthday, or say happy birthday to my mom. Right? You do it. I see it all the time when I'm reading my sister's Facebook page. Right? So think about it. So if someone is trying to get your information, they might be able to piece it together, right? Because they know your mom's birthday, right? You use it. So, and think about people who try to hack and not doing it one and all. This is something they do. Right, so we tend to use passwords that are very unique. Uh, it, it, it means something special to us. Right? It, it has, and, and it's also because it is it's something we can remember. Right, so we're we won't use our birthday, but we might use some derivation of our birthday, like our year or the month. Right, so people, and then most of our uh, email. So if you think about the user ID, the user ID in a lot of a lot of times. It's some derivation of our name or our email address, and then we come up. How many people use the same password all the time for everything? <laughs> right? Because it's easy. We just have too much stuff going through our head. Right? So it, it becomes easier for people to try to, to who, who do this, because they don't have to figure out a lot of combinations. Right? So one of the things that, you know, I, I read this article and I started to do it is to use your favorite movie, the, uh, the first letters uh, of your favorite movie, the name of the title of your favorite movie, or your favorite book, or your favorite song, or your spouse's favorite song, or your significant other's favorite song, right? They're the only ones who would really know that, right? And honestly, I don't think my husband can tell you what my favorite song is. I, I doubt it. So, you know, so he can't act it. But I just can't get it. I don't focus on this Because he tells me, you know, he just leaves it lying around or he asks me questions and I, I make a note, especially to the bank account. <laughs> so, you know, so we, but I started doing that because I became, well, not packing as my husband's bank account, but, you know, I started changing how I, you know, what I use for my passwords because I was, I do the same thing. I use the same password all the time. It was some derivation of my name. It was somebody who was really close to me, their birthday, and so it was just easier to figure out. And then if you think about it, your favorite book or your favorite movie, you, you remember that, right? So it's, it's kind of easier to remember. Um, but anyway, so passwords are, and, and also passwords are where companies are most vulnerable, right? Because people write their passwords down and all of the other things like this. So it's a, it, 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 allows them someone, that's where the that's a point where a company is vulnerable. That's an entry point where they're vulnerable. So depending on what area you're, you are in a company, you could have you could have access to very sensitive information. So anyway, uh, the other thing is another way is automatic terminal lock off. So imagine if you're in um, the uh, shipping department or something uh, similar. Right. And you're at the terminal, and you, you can, so shipping, you authorize the release of inventory. You walk away from, you sign in, 
you, you take care of some shipping, uh, shipping some items, and then you walk away. If your terminal doesn't automatically shut it off, and you forgot to sign off, because most people do, right? You forgot to sign off, now the company's inventory system is open to anyone who walks by. Right? Then you can now do inventory because they have access. So you look for automatic terminal log on. Um, you want to see also that the company is, so if, again, it's not the auditor's responsibility to design controls. It's a company's responsibility to design controls and review and test that those controls are operating effectively, not wait until the auditor comes in. So you want to see uh, documentation and evidence that the company is reviewing that access rights and comparing that to uses, right? Looking at, because one of the outputs that you do have uh, or access you have uh, systems is you can review the logs, the process logs. So logs contain a valuable information and so you auditors can get access to the logs and work with those logs. Um, and then also to ensure that there are um, a process in place to report breaches of security and communicate that, and that it's dealt with timely. So those are just some examples of controls related to access. Um, assertions. So the two important assertions, two important assertions related to general control would be accuracy and occurrence. And so accuracy obviously is, uh, you know, we want to ensure that the information is entered accurately prior to <coughs> programs being implemented. That the accuracy of data is accurate programs prior to implementation. So you look for hardware controls, uh, program development controls, which we just talked about, and change and then controls over operations. And then occurrence, that restricted inappropriate access reduces the probability of fictitious transactions. Right? Because occurrence says that it's valid, it did occur. And so you want to try to restrict access. And again, we can look for controls uh, related to you know, operation controls and access to programs and data controls. We also have input controls. So input controls relate to uh, making sure that all transactions are input, that they're input accurately, and they're input once and only once, right? No duplicate transactions. So it provides, you, you're looking to ensure that transactions that are input or information that's input, I should say. Information that's input into the system is authorized and it's input accurately. So if you think about things that initiate a transaction, such as a customer order or uh, a, a purchase order, right? those initiate the transaction. Uh, and so you want to make sure, you know, the auditor wants to ensure that uh, there are proper controls around that. And so, again, going back to occurrence and the revenue cycle, we want to ensure that uh, transactions or sales are reported for the transactions that actually happen and occur and to non fictitious customers. So you want to see controls around the sales order process because it initiates um, a transaction. Uh, there's also processing controls. So what are some of the things that it are involved in the process of reporting a sales transaction? What has to happen before you record that transaction? Goods have to be shipped, right? Shipping. And prior to shipping, what has to happen? Credit, right, credit authorization. So that's the process. So you input the sales order. It, that before it, the item gets goes to shipping, you want to see evidence that credit approval has been um, has been performed, right? So there's some evidence whether that happens in the system. And the way that can happen in an accounting information system, where you don't have a paper trail, is that it goes that when that order is input, right, it goes to a, an alert or it goes to the inbox of the credit manager. 
and the credit manager is the person that review, will review it and then initiate um, the order to or release it to ship to ship it so that the order can be shipped and that the transaction can be completed. Right? So you want to see that those are the kinds of controls that are built in. And so you want to see the transactions and process accurately, right? So what's accurate in that case that the credit approval uh, the, 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 the customer has been checked for credit approval. Um, that the transaction actually occurred is processed. It's processed because we ship the goods. Because that's what's going to trigger the sale. The shipment of the goods. And that's what's going to update the revenue. And we want to know that it's only processed once. So when that customer order goes in, right, there's a customer number assigned to that customer order. That customer order should not be input twice. An order for an uh, order for that customer should not be input twice, unless the customer is ordering something totally different. Right? Placing Google. Some examples of controls is that the client should be testing that controls are processing. <coughs> I'm sorry, the transactions are processing accurately. That the programs are accurately processing the transactions. So if the transaction is input and it goes out to input of customer order, there's some uh, check to ensure that it is a valid customer. So if you put in that customer number and that customer is not, that number is not in the customer master file, the program should kick it out. It should never go any further. So you would want to see uh, uh, evidence that that's what's occurring. So that you'd want to see that the company is testing that to ensure that it's processing correctly. Um, obviously, you have to have controls over uh, the file and operating controls, the computer operation controls. Um, you also want to see test that the transaction is updating the uh, the accounts appropriately or the journals appropriately, so you compare totals. Um, and what happens if there are any errors? How do they handle errors and resubmission of the transactions and it? So someone could input a customer order number incorrectly, right? So they'll kick it out because that customer signed it, the customer has it on. How do they, doc, what are the documentation procedures and uh, resubmission of those? And then you have input processing and then you have output controls, which deals with uh, the result of that uh, after the transaction has been processed. So reports would be an example of an output. So who controls out, who controls the reports, uh, who controls the information, who's responsible for reviewing and reconciling the information, and you still have those controls. So you want to make sure that uh, the output reflects accurate processing. Right? So you want to test if you put in uh, a sales order, a customer order, for 10 items. Uh, the report that comes out in the sales journal should reflect that you sold uh, 10 items to customer you know, XYZ on this day. So uh, the documentation should match it. You ship on a particular day. Right? That it's only people who should receive those reports have actually received the output or have access to the files that are generated for processing. So some examples controls, you want to see that there's evidence that the client is reviewing the output for reasonableness and they're you know, ensuring that what they input and how the transaction is processed is accurately reflected in the, the report. Uh, other things would be control total reports, any evidence of master file changes or updates, uh, and that is only limited to, the output is limited to those people who have the authority to um, so those are the, just a general um, uh, description of the types of controls. It's very high level, um, and I, I, you know, I don't, don't mean to get into a lot of detail here. But what's the auditor's role? So yes, the auditor has to, you know, they're gaining an understanding, assessing control. A lot of this, though, the auditor can really only assess the controls, and, so, and in some cases, a lot of cases, test those controls with the help of an IT auditor, especially um, when you're dealing with a very integrated system where a lot of the controls are built into the system. 
And so things like program change controls, the auditor can look to see if there's documentation about that the client has a process in place. But the IT auditor has to get in the system and determine whether or not there are program changes. Right? Um, because if there's a program change, there should be documentation supporting that program change. But that only tells you the output. The documentation only tells you about the changes that were made. It doesn't tell you if it's complete. Right? It doesn't tell you if you have all the changes that were made uh, to the system. Right? That requires someone knowledgeable to go in and identify whether or not there were any program changes. Right? And that's why documentation is so important because you have the system documentation um, prior, and the, the IT monitor will look to see if that, if, if that documentation continues to support the system uh, as it's operating now. And if it doesn't, there should be a corresponding program change. So, um, informing an assessment of control risks, uh, the auditor, with the, in conjunction with the IT auditor, has to identify what are the types of assessments that could occur. So this is when you're looking, so for example, if you're looking at the um, order to cash uh, application, you can ship some errors that could think about the errors we talked about when we talked about sales and collection cycle. Uh, goods could be reported, uh, I'm sorry, sales could be reported um, incorrectly, meaning that you recorded sales for a transaction or, or, or for goods that didn't ship. The shipment didn't occur and the sale has been recorded. It could be recorded on the wrong date. Sales could be missing, right? You could have shipped goods and not recorded it as a sale. So you have to think about what are the types of misstatements that could occur and what controls are in the system that would prevent or detect that on a timely basis. Um, identify the points where the misstatements could occur. So in the example where sales were reported, uh, could be reported, uh, and there's no corresponding shipment, right, that is at the point of the shipment, right, or at the point when you're updating the accounting records or the, the credit account more specifically. Cut off, you know, uh, again, when is that going to occur? Around the time that goods are shipped. So in the shipping uh, process. Identify the controls and procedures designed to prevent or detect the statements. So again, looking at the client system, uh, understanding what their controls are, if they have, a, they should have a control in place that says, um, uh, sales are only reported based on a, that, uh, an authorized shipping document. That's evidence. So the sale is updated, revenue is updated when the shipping document. So when accounts receivable or accounting department receives the shipping document, is when they update the general ledger or update the sales journal. So you want to see if, if that happens in the system, what you want to know or gather evidence that it is happening accurately, it's happening at the point the shipment occurs, right? The revenue is being updated. So you're going to, and so a, a part of the general controls would be who has access, right? Who has access is a proper segregation of duties, and uh, the automated application controls you would look at when, uh, when, when that shipping document is, when the shipment occurs that you see simultaneously that accounts, uh, the sales journal is updated and accounts receivable the sub is updated. And then evaluate whether or not the control procedures are effective. Are they effective? Can you rely on them? So again, this is something that auditors, financial auditors would have to work with uh, IT auditors. Because IT auditors, you know, unless they have um, a financial audit background, they're going to be more focused on uh, the IT controls, the general controls. App. So they're going to look at it much more from this higher level. But an auditor knows that, a financial auditor knows that the application controls are built around management, uh, uh, related to management assertions, right? Or so it's important for them to work with IT to say, well, 
these are the kinds of controls that we need to see in place. And we need to know that before revenue is recorded, there's a shipping document, that there's a, a way, there is a control in place to ensure that that only happens. And if that's happening in the system, the auditor needs to understand exactly how that's happening in the system and timing on that. Right? They need to know that when the shipment happened, it automatically sales revenue was updated. Revenue was updated and accounts receivable um, was updated. So the way auditors can test controls, computer controls, is the standard. Talk to the client. What kind of controls do you have in place? Uh, is that a control a system? Is it a system uh, control? Uh, observe. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to observe if, if the control is happening in the system. Um, you could also they'll also inspect the documentary evidence, assuming there's an output, there's an audit trail, um, or we perform. So normally, so what you will see mostly is the auditor will be the control. Right? And they'll use test data to do that. And what we mean by test data is in, introducing uh, simulated transactions into the system. Um, so a simulated transaction, as I said before, an auditor would um, create a transaction. So this takes coordination, right, with it, because you can't just put um, Every, you know, most transactions in the company the system. So it takes coordination with uh, uh, the customer client and their IT department. But the simulated transactions contain no errors, right? Because you're trying to test the controls. So if you're trying to test the three-way match, you can, uh, uh, the auditor can initiate a fictitious disbursement. If the client's controls are working correctly, then that disbursement should never be processed, right? It should be kicked out immediately. Because it's fictitious, there is no purchase order, there is no receiving report, there's no invoice. So that's a way that uh, the auditor would test, you know, to test the control, the processing of transactions in the system, right? If it doesn't kick it out, the, the control's not operating effectively. So you, you can't rely on it if it doesn't kick it out. And the auditor only has to do one of each type of transaction right, to test that. Why is that? Why don't they have to take a sample of right. If it's operating that way for one transaction, there's no reason to believe that it would not. There's nothing magical about the transaction. Does it meet this criteria? Right, it's a computer. Program certain criteria. Does the transaction meet this criteria? If it doesn't, it's kicked out. If it does, then it's processed. So you only have to test it one time. Uh, just to summarize some end user environment issues, control issues, uh, because this is outside of the system, right? Uh, lack of segregation of duties, lack of physical security, lack of documentation and limited knowledge of computer personnel, right? So the, it's not, any of you, if you've worked in a, an organization, uh, the computer systems or the, the hardware for the company, the, the nerve center for um, the information system environment is always under locking, restricted access, right? Because your, the company's information system is an asset. They're, that's their asset. And so we talked about controls, and it's important to safeguard assets, and it's no different with information. So you expect to see that there's proper controls and so uh, around who has access to, uh, you know, the physical access to the computer system, um, as well as access, you know, access um, through your, your, your desktops or your laptops, and there is control by passwords. It's controlled by, uh, there, there's a process in place to ensure that someone's reviewing that, for example, if you are in shipping, then you should not have the ability to ship goods. You should have no access to inventory through your computer. So restricted through your, that someone's uh, 
making sure that the controls over who is assigned access to things. And that access is granted based on their need to have access to information. Um, if uh, some of the uh, problems as a result of that, some of the implications is if you don't control access, if you don't have the proper segregation of duties, then what you created is a critical, a critical control issue, right? Because then people now have uh, access that they shouldn't have, and it makes the system even more vulnerable. Uh, um, so again, those are some important areas to cover. Um, in terms of computer fraud, just a quick note. Um, I think we, we are all kind of knowledgeable about this uh, because of because companies are vulnerable, and it's, it's certainly now when we talk about information in the cloud, um, and you know, companies have to deal with with computer fraud. Right? They have to have they have to recognize that they're vulnerable. They have to continue to evaluate where they're vulnerable and address those vulnerabilities. Um, and the controls you'd like to see is that they're hopefully preventive. Right, that they have you know, controls in place that have prevented from happening because it, detective controls are, are good, obviously, but it's, for that means it's already happened. And so it depends on how timely you respond to that breach. Um, that's going to really determine how much, uh, how much damage has been done. So uh, it, it's an ongoing uh, issue. So let's, before we break, do one quick problem. And it's problem 850, which is on page 873. Just do part A. Just identify some of the uh, weaknesses that exist in this short scenario. Thousand dollars worth of transactions. The output 
uh, for sales transactions for that day should agree to your control zones. So it's a way to check um, that the transactions are being processed correctly. What else? Anything else? Some more.
So if the, the, the documentation is deficient, talk about the fact that there's no computer price list, um, there should be one. Failure to use control totals and processing controls. Uh, we talked about they should implement that if it's appropriate. The new bound proceedings of shipping notices is manually checked by the bill clerk. Uh, the computer should do that automatically. Um, control totals determined by the bill clerk. Uh, does not appear to be used appropriately, so the billing clerk should be using it to compare to the sales process by the computer. So it's a, a way of checking that transactions were processed accurately. Um, and we talked about the fact that uh, the account receivable uh, records should not be in the form of open, a file that contains open uh, receivables. It should be uh, a system generated. So those are just, uh, those were the key weaknesses. So um, I'm going to break here. Uh, there's a quiz, which is due next Tuesday.